Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to you. I can never remember where the camera is. It's there. Welcome to you watching online. Um, as we come to open God's word this morning, I want to start off by asking you a question. What is the greatest journey you've ever been on? Over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the great wait, the great announcement, and today we're looking at the great journey. Not the journey of thousands of miles that the wise men took to find the baby Jesus, but the great journey that we can take so that we can worship the baby Jesus. A journey of a place where we're doing life on our own, in our own strength, back to a place with God, where we're doing life with God in his strength. So in the beginning, when God created the world, everything was perfect. There was no war, no sickness, no death. Everything worked together in harmony. I'm guessing the climate was perfect, so we didn't have to worry about energy costs. There was no greed, no anger, no jealousy, no fear, no lies. Everything was good and worked together. We were loved and we were secure and we were content. It was perfect. And God was at the center. He was worshipped and we were loved and secure and had an unbroken relationship with him. But as we know... That all went wrong because the first human beings fell to temptation and they listened to the lies of our enemy, the devil, and they rejected God's ways. And because of that, our relationship with God is broken and we left that place of perfection and security. And you know, ever since that awful day, human beings have been trying to find their way back to that place, a, pl a place of peace and wholeness and well-being. And we have pointers bombarding us every day, showing us the way back to that place of well-being and security and happiness. And the signposts are things like, buy this product and you'll find contentment. Buy this product and you'll look young forever. It's not going to happen. Put your money with us and your future will be secure. Seriously. Do this or do that and it will be the answer to all your problems. Join this website and you'll find your dream job or your dream relationship. And all these things, they have one thing in common. Whether it's emotional or spiritual or physical. And that one thing is that we're trying to get back to a place of completeness and well-being and wholeness and contentment because we need that. That's how we were wired. That's the place that we were meant to live in. But the road we need to be on, the journey we need to take, is the road that leads us to Jesus. Because when we're on the Jesus road, that will lead us back into a right relationship, an unbroken relationship again with God. I just want to take a moment before we get into the scripture we're going to be looking at this morning. You could close your eyes if you find that helpful. If you don't find it helpful, don't bother. But I just want you to imagine what comes into your mind, what image comes into your mind when you hear the name Jesus. Maybe it was uh, Jesus the baby. Maybe Jesus the compassionate man. Jesus on the cross. Or maybe Jesus resurrected and glorious. Or maybe you imagine a picture like this one. The Light of the World by Holman Hunt. I grew up with that picture. It was um, in my great aunt's bedroom from right from when I was a little girl. I used to look at that picture. There was something that drew me to that. So all these different kind of images that may have come to your mind. 
But of course, at this time of year, the baby Jesus is the image that we have around us most frequently on cards and advent calendars, the center of the nativity plays acted out by our children. Because this is the time of year when we're celebrating his incarnational birth, when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Born to save his people, born to be king of the Jews. And you know, Easter time, when we focus on his death and resurrection, you may remember that king of the Jews is actually nailed up above his cross. So in both the major Christian festivals, we have the, the kind of idea, the image of Jesus as king. But it struck me that, you know, also with both those two Christian festivals, the major Christian festivals, Jesus is actually portrayed as someone weak. We have a weak and vulnerable newborn baby or a man dying on a cross who would appear weak and very vulnerable and powerless. So who do people understand Jesus to be? If those are the two images that are most prevalent in the festivals. Reminds me of the question Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? You see, Jesus is so much more than a baby. He's so much more than a man. He's so much more than a king. He is also a priest. And that's what we're going to be focusing on a bit this morning. And as we go through the journey through the Bible, we will see how everything points to Jesus. In the beginning, when God created the world, Jesus was there. At the fall of man, Jesus was there. All through the Old Testament, you can find pointers to Jesus if we look for him. It all centers around Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And the bigger Jesus is in our understanding, the more awesome and eternal and completely huge the more we will fall on our knees and worship him. When we, we take that mindset of he's just a baby or just a man or just a man on a cross, but he's huge. It's all about Jesus. The story that we're going to be looking at this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 7. It is a very random little story. If you've got your Bibles to hand, do find it, otherwise it will come up on the screen. Hebrews chapter 7, I'm just going to read the very last line of Hebrews chapter 6. Um, talking about Jesus, it says, He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Then chapter 7, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. So, just as a little bit of background, the writer to the Hebrews, as the name would imply, is writing to a group of Christians who have come out of a Jewish background. They were beginning to feel persecuted. You see, Judaism, under Roman law, was an accepted and legal religion. And generally speaking, so long as they didn't rock the boat, they were left alone and they were able to worship in their temple and do all their religious Jewish stuff and it was fine. But Christianity, however, at that point was neither legal nor recognized and not accepted. And so to be a Christian could be very costly because not only were you thrown out of the synagogue, but you were also seen as a threat to the Roman authorities. So when these Jews had decided to follow Jesus, they'd put themselves on the right road. But now, that road was proving a very difficult road to travel. And the temptation was for the new Christians to revert back 
to Judaism. In fact, they would have had to have renounced uh, Jesus as the Messiah publicly in the, the synagogue. They needed to forget about Jesus. Just go back to how you were, living a quiet life. Don't rock the boat, keep your head down. Just get on with it. Just forget about Jesus and then you'll be fine. And you know, it's a temptation that we can also encounter for ourselves today. Sometimes it's a lot easier just not to mention Jesus, just keep your head down, get, keep going. And the writer to the Hebrews is basically saying, no, don't do that. Don't get off the road that you've got on. Think about it. You were living under a whole heap of laws. You were always hoping that you'd be good enough and please God enough and sacrifice enough and do everything enough then to make atonement for the things you'd done wrong that you knew were not pleasing to God. Don't go back to living like that because Jesus is better than all your high priests. Jesus is better than all the sacrifices. Through Jesus, you have direct access to God. Don't give up. Don't lose the hope you have in Jesus. It's like a, an anchor to the soul and has given you back the unbroken relationship with God. So keep going with Jesus. You see, the way it went with the Jews was that the, the people would bring a tenth of their wealth to the priests. They, they'd present that to the priests. The priests would go off. They'd kill an animal. It was a horribly bloodthirsty affair. Present that as a, an offering to, on the altar. Then they'd go back and then they would forgive the people. But who were these priests? And why did the people need a priest? Why do we need a priest? It's because God is holy and we are not. He said, we can't just bowl up to God, trusting in our own righteousness. It would be like standing 10 feet from the sun. You would just be consumed in its brilliance. It, it, it just can't happen. When Moses wrote the law, it was established that only men from the tribe of Levi could be a priest. That's important for us to remember. Only men from the tribe of Levi could be a priest. But now, the writer to the Hebrews is saying, you don't need all these sacrifices. You don't need all these priests anymore. Jesus is the perfect once and for all sacrifice and he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Who is this person, Melchizedek? This event that the writer is talking about between Abraham and Melchizedek took place hundreds of years before the law of Moses was even written, when it was established that only someone from the tribe of Levi could be a priest. This is one of the Bible's very first signposts to Jesus, right back in Genesis 14. Here we have this priestly event happening. It's a tithe being given and a blessing being received by a priest who has no lineage not a descendant of Levi because he hadn't even been born yet. Now, if we skip to verse 11, we read this. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron, Aaron being a Levite. In other words, if the sacrificial system with all its blood sacrifices and, and priests and atonement from sin and all that kind of stuff, if that worked, then why were we looking for anything else? Why, why look for anything other? And this also raises an interesting question. If only people that were from the Levi, the, the line of Levi, if they were the only ones who could be a priest, then how come Jesus can be our, be our priest? Because he's from the line of Judah, not the line of Levi. This is why Melchizedek proves to be a very important character. 
and is right at the start of the great journey. Because God, knowing that the system of priests and sacrifice is, is never going to work to resolve the problem of sin, is pointing us way back then, pointing us to a future where the whole system is going to change. Another priest would come, Jesus. Not from the line of Levi, but from the order of Melchizedek. Basically has no line. In verse 16, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest, talking about Jesus, in the order of Melchizedek. The same as Melchizedek, who has no lineage, no beginning, no end. He's a very interesting, one-off character. And his name and status are king of righteousness and king of peace. That's who Melchizedek is. Picking up in verse 18, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant, a better agreement between God and us. Now, verse 23, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus, today, is pleading our cause at the right hand of God the Father. What an incredible thought that is. I wonder if any of us thought of that when we heard the name Jesus. That today, he is pleading our cause. He's standing in the presence of God, pleading our cause. Baby Jesus, King Jesus, is also our priest. Not only will he be king of the Jews, but he will be priest forever. I got very excited about this uh, next bit because I get excited for things like this. As you go through the whole of the Old Testament, the way God ordered and ordained things, you could either be a king or a priest. You couldn't be both. Saul tried it once. King Saul took on some priestly roles. Did not end well for him. So this Melchizedek is one of a kind. He's both king of Salem, which later, interestingly, becomes Jerusalem. I love the way God ties up loose ends, but that's a completely different sermon. And he is a priest. And since he's pointing to Jesus, you can see why God made it clear that no one could become king and priest, except when we get to Jesus. Only Jesus can be both king and priest, like Melchizedek. Jesus is everything we need to arrive at our destination that puts us right with God to mend that broken relationship. He is a king, he is a priest. He's also the final sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. And in verse 26, it says, such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He is the one who stands between us and God the Father. He will accept our worship and he will bless us. You know, Melchizedek's name actually means king of righteousness. So he is king of righteousness by name, king of peace by position. So in the, the great sweep of the, the great journey through the whole of the Bible, 
We have this tiny little story recorded in Genesis 14. There's a small mention of it in one of the Psalms, Psalm 110, and then it's recorded, recounted again in Hebrews. This man called Melchizedek, and I thought, well, that's all very interesting, but how does Melchizedek help me on a Monday morning? Well, Melchizedek doesn't help me on a Monday morning, but what Melchizedek does is points me to the one who does help me on a Monday morning. And you know, I thought, I, I, I don't know how you feel sometimes, but I, I, watched, I was watching the news a couple of days ago, and it was dire, really. That, you know, there's, there's fighting, there's wars, there's, there's famine, there's people dying all over the place. It was just horrendous watching the news. And it can feel very hopeless. But when we consider a story like this one, right back, almost at the beginning, where God sends this strange figure, Melchizedek, into the picture, it, what it says to me is that God has got a plan. And it goes right back. And there's going to be so much that happens between Melchizedek and Abraham to Jesus appearing and Jesus coming back because we haven't got there yet. But all the details as you go through the whole journey of the Bible all fits together and that gives me hope. So when I look at the world around us which just seems hopelessly broken, stories like this remind me that God is a God of detail and he knows the big picture. So let me ask you the same question again. What is the greatest journey you've ever been on? For me, the longest journey I've ever been on was coming back from Tasmania. You can't really get much further away, can you? Otherwise, you're coming back already. So it was Tasmania to Melbourne to Singapore to London. took 36 hours. But the greatest journey I ever taken was when I was 30 years old. I was doing life on my own in my own strength trusting in my own capabilities, but never really feeling secure in my own identity, looking for security and well-being, probably sometimes in the wrong directions, sometimes a bit scared of the future, not even wanting to think about what might happen when I died. But I went from that place back to God where I no longer did life in my own strength, but in his strength. When I got my security from him and not from other people. And my identity was wrapped up in him and not mine. No longer being scared of the future and knowing where I'm going when I die. That was the greatest journey. You know, when we, when we take a physical journey, it's good to know where you are and where you want to be. It's good to have a map or a sat-nav. It's good to plan a route before you set off. And then we look for pointers along the way to check that we are still on the right road. Anyone who knows me well will know that for me to get myself anywhere is nothing short of a miracle. My most spectacular journey was trying to find my way to Milton Keynes, which I managed to miss entirely. I don't know how. I ended up driving for five hours. I eventually got home via Bristol. <laughs> because in my desperation, I saw a signpost to Bristol, and I thought, well, at least if I'm there, I'll know how to get home from that point. So that's where I headed. I drove for five hours. I took a whole tank of petrol and completely missed my appointment with the regional minister of the Baptist Union, who I was having an interview with to see if I would be suitable as a preacher. Just as well, I wasn't going for a tour guide, wasn't it? So there's long journeys, there's frustrating journeys, there's journeys that just take you round and round in circles. But the greatest journey any of us will ever make is not a physical journey, but a spiritual journey. <coughs> the phrase, we're all on a journey, has become very popular, but it is actually quite true. But so many people in the world are actually looking at the wrong signposts. I'm just going to mute myself while I cough.
Uh, I've caught Stephen's cough. That's what's happened, but never mind. You know, when I got lost going to Milton Keynes, um, I should have stopped and turned around because I knew I was going in the wrong direction. But I just kept going, even though I knew it was in the wrong direction. I didn't have to get home via Bristol. That was ludicrous. But I took that route because it was one with which I was familiar. And I thought that sometimes we can be a bit like that on our spiritual journey. We start off okay, but then we get lost. And we know we've gone in the wrong direction, but we just keep going in the wrong direction rather than stop and turn around. And the reason often we do that is because the wrong direction is one that we're more familiar with. When we decide to follow Jesus and recognize him as king of peace and king of righteousness, we are on the right road. We are on the road with the one who was there from the beginning of time, is there with us now, and will be with us forever. Some of you have been on the right road for many decades, and soon, the reality is, you will reach your final destination. Maybe there are some of you here today who are on the right road, but today, you're actually finding that road a really difficult road to be on. Maybe it's a costly road right now. Maybe you're being tempted to get off that road. But could I say to you, like the Hebrew writer, the writer to the Hebrew says, don't do that. Stay on the narrow path. Don't come off the road. I've been there more than once. This Christian life is just too hard. This road is too narrow. I, I just, I've had enough. I want to get off, do things my own way, and go in my own direction. But the Jesus road is the right road. And if that's you this morning, then could I really encourage you to come afterwards at the end of the service and get someone to pray with you, to encourage you to stay on the right road, even though for you today it might be a difficult road to travel. And there may be some of you here this morning who are not even on the road. But there's nothing stopping you today to start your journey back to God and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I started off by asking us to think of Jesus. And really this morning I think I... I just wanted to somehow elevate our understanding of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is everything that any of us will ever need. He, he is the answer to the world's problems. I absolutely 100% believe that. He's so much more than a baby. So much more than a man. So much more than a king. He's more than a priest. He is everything. He is our prophet, priest, king, savior, friend, brother, guide, provider, through whom all things were made and by whom all things hold together. So next time you see the baby in the manger, which will probably be sometime today, just remind yourself the awesomeness of Jesus, the bigness of Jesus, and take him from just that baby into the God and King that he is. Let me just pray for us before Kirsty comes back up and we're going to sing um, O Holy Night. Father, I want to thank you for this strange little obscure story found throughout your word. This story of this man, Melchizedek. And Lord, I want to thank you that through this story, we can see that you are a God of detail. You are a God with a plan. That it's not just all coincidence and things out of control, but you actually are on top of things. 
And I pray for all of us, Lord, today, that as we go out into this week, no matter what that week might hold, we'll hold on to that fact that you, you know the end from the beginning. And we can be secure in that fact. Even if the road is rough for us right now, help us, Lord, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and know that you are a God who is in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.